I mean, the first question really is, to what extent has art as a form, as a complete schema in itself disappeared, and that we no longer have uh, a really all, a sort of all-embracing art history. Um, in art schools, um, they replace very largely art history with cultural studies or cultural and historical studies. Um, they've got various names to critical theory. Uh, history derives from the Greek historia, meaning inquiry and knowledge acquired by investigation. Herodotus, 5th century BC, was the Greek historian who established the foundations of the study of history. On a simple level, the construction of the idea of art history derives from Vasari's The Lives of Artists from 1550 and Hegel's notion of periods of art, the narratives of artists' lives and the abstraction born out of periods combines to give us a compelling assemblage that has its own distinct method, that of assembling facts, creating deductions and claims and then speculating on outcomes of such a process. So structurally, there's two, two strands to art history as a construction, that of the, the lives of artists, a kind of narrative of artists' lives, um, which still persists today and Hegelian abstraction of historical passages or moments or periods. So we have narratives, classification and periodization. Development of art history was accompanied by, by that of aesthetic theory. You could say that art history deals with the facts of art, whereas aesthetic theory deals with the speculation on what art is. Aesthetic theory very rarely mentions exact artifacts. It's much more inclined for abstractions to do with issues of beauty, sublime, um, and so forth, uh, rather than looking at analysis of exact works of art. Does someone else read Lesser? The development of museums coincides with Renaissance and Enlightenment philosophy. The Prado in Madrid was opened in 1785. The Uffizi in Florence was built between 1560 to 1581 and designed by Giorgio Vasari to house the art collection begun in the 15th century by Cosmo de Medici. The Hermitage was founded in 1764 by Catherine the Great and opened to the public in 1852. The Louvre in Paris opened in 1793 and the British Museum in London in 1759. Museum culture served to stimulate a demand for classification and commentary, which was part of the basis of art historical discourse. <clears throat> Hegel's central thesis is that art's content is both theological and in turn historical. Hegel determines that the highest attainment of art was with the Greeks. Hegel understood the historical nature of art by dividing it into three stages or forms, the symbolic, the classical, and the romantic, which correspond to three stages of religion in the form of the religion of nature, Greek pantheism, and revealed religion. So the symbolic is like um, Egyptian culture or Indian culture. The classical is Greek and Roman. The romantic is the romantic and modern, but it starts with the romantic in art. But it, it's a sort of broad idea of the modern as well. Someone else read this. Ego firstly separated art from philosophy with so retaining the rom romantic belief that art was the means of establishing ontological knowledge. This lends to art a speculative function. Before the romantics, art was not considered as a philosophical concept and by elevating art's speculative, speculative fun, foundation, 
they saw art as higher in its claims of a relationship to infinity or the absolute than philosophy. Hegel reversed this and placed philosophy above art, claiming that it is only philosophy that can have an embodied relationship to the absolute. Hegel stated that art no longer counts for us as the highest manner in which truth obtains existence for itself. In turn, Hegel also concludes that art no longer fills our our highest need, and that as such becomes something that is not that is now past. This is what is implied by the commonly cited idea of the death of art, that has been such a ma major preoccupation within 20th century modernity. The very existence of aesthetics implies the end of art, because otherwise it would not be possible to conceive art as a systematic to totality. Continue. This is someone else reading because you've got a lot of background noise. Thunder. Symbolic art is characterized by a separation between spiritual content and the sensuous realization, and thus lacks a sense of unity. In his commentary upon Egyptian sculpture, there is a lack of inner creative freedom. In classical art, the mutual correspondence between content and sensuous form is realized, and this is attributed in part to the fact that the human body assumes the central concern of the culture. The human body is truly able to express the spirituality that inhabits it, and through this, a reconciliation of spirit and matter can be achieved. For Hegel, this implied the divine becoming imminent in man, thus aligning sensuous form with an expanded sense of interiority. Yet this interiority is identified with the immediacy of a bodily form and thus cannot reconcile interiority knowing itself as an infinite form of subjectivity. So he claimed that the classical art of the Greeks was the highest attainment of, in the history of art. This is from the symbolic period. This is what he calls symbolic. She often had this multiplicity or heterogeneous kind of organization of bodily or formal formal elements. This is a Shiva Nataraja from the Chola period, this is South Indian. This is around 10th, 11th century. In one hand, Shiva, the, the uh, one hand beats the hour drum, it's the birth of time. And the other hand is, is the flame of uh, the dissolution of the universe. The one hand points downwards is towards release, and the hand pointing upwards is is do not fear. Um, he presses down on the dwarf of ignorance, and behind uh, around him is the flames of cosmic dissolution, and the hair is the river Ganges, and in the in the headdress is the, the moon and the, the crescent moon and the sun. And one ear is male and one ear is female. So it's the balancing of all worlds. So it's the birth and dissolution of the cosmos in one image. But that's typical of the symbolic function of art in Hegelian terms. This classical period is in the uh, uh, British Museum, uh, Greek river god, Lysios. And you get this balance in between form and sensuousness in such figures, a kind of almost in a pulse. So if you look at the difference between uh, Greek art, Greek sculpture, and um, cl classical um, copies in the uh, Roman period, it completely lacks it's, it's a copy of form, not, not of sensuousness and pulsation. Uh, this indicates a romantic, which is a double infinity. 
the monk looking over the sea and us looking at the monk looking over the sea that expresses a double relationship to infinity it's from 18, uh, 1808 to 1810 so the first art his history was um really looking at the Greek, the difference between Greek, Greco-Roman and Roman art. Uh, so it's associated with the figures of, figure of Winkleman in the 18th century. And it linked um, both art history and archaeology together. Who wants to read on Burkhardt? I can. Burkhardt was responsible for the elevation of the Italian Renaissance, and with this, the idea that it was a secular and autonomous mode of expression. He avoided writing in the manner of Vasari and instead focused on a history without names. This reflected an Hegelian approach of broad analysis over particulars. Art for Burkhardt was a medium through which the artist's spirit became visible. Wolf Wolflin was a Swiss art historian who was responsible for responsible the Baroque as a new stylistic category. He developed a number of principles arranged in separate pairs in order to describe the differences in styles. These pairs contrasted the linear with the painterly the planar with the recessional, closed and open form, multiplicity with unity, but each of these could be applied in a non-dogmatic, in non-dogmatic ways. So this gives the idea of the schema that he developed, so that art history goes with um, descriptions of periods, but also schemas of periods. So we see these oppositions in the red, red and the blue. The dirt in the birth of the avant-garde. Sharon, continue. Charles Baudelaire was firstly a poet and at the start of a great tradition of writers who played a pivotal role in the development of modernist art. Apollinaire, Marinetti, Selman, Zara, Marakovsky and Breton all served to articulate the respective avant-garde movements of the early 20th century. Romanticism is precisely situated neither in choice of subjects nor in exact truth, but in a mode of feeling. They looked for it outside themselves, but it was only to be found within. Continue. Who's next? Jessica. Modernity was conceived as having a distinct telos with one movement giving rise to the next by a series of negations. The idea of the avant-garde or being ahead of the game is at the heart of modernity. Modernity had to possess a cutting edge. Modernity to find itself in opposition to, to tradition under the sign of newness. In the early part of the 20th century, Freud's theorization of the unconscious and the idea of the uncertainty principle in physics served to undermine the idea that art was a knowable object of attention. Continue. Apollinaire was defender of cubism and a forefather of surrealism. He was said to have coined the term cubism as well as orphism in 1912. The term surrealism was employed by him in relationship to the ballet parade in 1917. He stated, I hate artists who are not of their time. So a certain conjunction between the image and temporality and period is forefronting with modernist development. Kamwala was an art historian and a great art dealer who helped, helped establish cubism at force. So we not only get the relationship between um, the avant-garde and art history, but also art dealing and the rise of museums. 
So the system of classification of art and the periodization and the movements of art all become coextensive. Andre Breton published the Surrealist Manifesto in 1924 and was the editor of the, the Revolution Surrealist from 1924. Breton was also an avid collector of art and, and, and ethnographic material. Freud's ideas influenced his ideas to do with automatic drawing and writing. So, looking at Panofsky was really a, a Kantian, but believed that uh, to a large extent art was a knowable object. And he, he provided a kind of a structural interpretation of what lays behind this model of interpretation, which gives rise to meaning. wants to read this? <clears throat> Bester, you read it. Erwin Panofsky's knowledge of Kant was extensive, particularly in regard to his ideals of critique, freedom, and autonomy, and in this regard is remembered as much as a philosopher of art as, a art, as an art historian. The freedom of the judging subject was central to Panofsky and this idea of the stable subject was at the heart of both his sense of objectivity and in turn his humanism. In his 1924 to 25 essay, Perspective as Symbolic Form, Panofsky discusses Renaissance perspective as a cultural convention that mediates the relationship of subject and object. Perspective for Panofsky is a systematization of the external world that extends the domain of the self. Panofsky followed the direction of Ernst Cassier in his opposition to Heidegger's Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics, and this not only implied a turning away from Heidegger, but from Hegel also, both figures seeing history as a problem that required resolution. When Panofsky arrived in the United States in the 1930s, Panofsky appeared to have lessened his relationship to theory and assumed, and assumed a much more empirical outlook. Begun in 1924 and left unfinished at the time of his death in 1929, the Masomini Atlas is Abby Warburg's attempt to map the afterlife of antiquity or how images of great symbolic, intellectual, and emotional power emerge in Western antiquity and then reappear and are reanimated in the art and cosmology of later times and places from Alexandrian Greece to Weimar Germany. Focusing especially on the Renaissance, the historical period where he found the struggle between the forces of reason and unreason to be most, palat most palpable, Warburg hoped that the Masomini Atlas would allow its spectators to experience for themselves the polarities that riddle culture and thought. For the materialist historian, Every epoch with which he occupies himself is only a force, history of that which really concerns him, and that is precisely why the appearance of repetition doesn't exist for him in history, because the moments in the course of history which matter most to him become moments of the present through their index as for history, and change their characteristics according to the catastrophic or triumphant determination of that present, and then the image of Walter Benjamin and the Arcades Project. The camera introduces us to unconscious optics as does psychoanalysis to unconscious impulses. Walter Benjamin. A figure who has a very close relationship with uh, Benjamin is uh, Theodore Dono, who wrote one of the largest undertakings of aesthetic theory in the 20th century. He died in 1969, I think it was published in 1970, un, un, unfinished. Uh, but he states, artworks detach themselves from the empirical world and bring forth another world, one opposed to, 
to the other world as if this world were, were too an autonomous entity. Thus, however tragic they appear, artworks tend to a priori tend a priori towards affirmation. The cliches of art, art's reconciling glow in enabling enfolding the world are repugnant. Not only not only because they parody the emphatic content concept of art with its bourgeois version and class. In amongst those Sunday institutions, Sunday institutions that provide solace. So Adorno's, I mean, main idea is that art should be separate and resistant to the mainstream of society. That the autonomy of art is a separation from the social flux. So here's a diagram of a Hegelian mapping of his main ideas, so his schematic outline. By modernity. Jessica. The paradox in the evolution of the French painting from Courbet to Suzanne is how it was brought to the verge of abstraction in and by its very effort to transcribe visual appearance with ever greater fidelity. The Greenberg modernist painting finds its essence through the development of its own self-critical impulse that renders art pure, thus apart both from the literary and from the kitsch. Greenberg lent to his account of art a mode of teleological accomplishment in the form of absolute opticality through which its own transcendent truth could be realized, a form of optical ideality. So um, Greenberg was a Kantian formalist who believes that art moves towards autonomous condition of, of optical purity and flatness and grace. Continue. In the post-war years, it was the figure of Clement Greenberg who assumed this position inherited from Kant, and this in terms of, <clears throat> in turn appeared to lend him as a figurehead an extraordinary level of authority in regard to judgment. Certainly in the post-war years, this stature and in turn con controversy is perhaps unrivaled. It is perhaps too easy to slip into a parody of Greenberg's critical endeavor and in turn muse at what now appears to be an almost alien set of values based upon visual purity, self-referentiality, beauty, autonomy, freedom, surface, abstraction, and truth. Also his polemics against pop art, minimalism, and conceptualism do little for a whole series of generations who have developed their ideas based upon the hybridization of these three counter movements against post war formalism. Clement Greenberg appeared to directly and indirectly cite Kant as being the most influential fig figure in his thinking about art. Some critics felt that his understanding of Kant was non-systematic or even faulty, but it is nonetheless persistent, particularly in regard to the purity of disinterestedness and aesthetic autonomy. What links many of Greenberg's essays, such as avant-garde and kitsch, towards the new Lacombe and modernist painters is the idea of the autonomy of art, and with this, his elevation of the role of taste the notion of the purity of the aesthetic became the cornerstone of what became termed as formalist criticism. Abstract art was the best ally in the struggle against kitsch because it places a demand of formal response of the audience in terms of a self-regulated relationship to specific medium. Self-criticism and the impulse of modernity are paired together and this is rooted in the Enlightenment as opposed to romanticism for Greenberg. Form was the central arena of the work of purification through which art achieved its tele teleology of self-reflection. Whereas modernity is associated with memory by Greenberg, postmodernism is associated with forgetting. 
and uh, uh, the next generation to Greenberg was Michael Fried, developed a critique of minimalism by uh, claiming it introduced theatricality because this undermined the autonomy of the work of art and turned it, in, uh, turned it into an event. So as part of his idea was that you had to walk around the sculpture, you couldn't, there wasn't one, one vantage point in which you could see the totality of it. And this is what he called theatrical. Louis de Lippard was associated with the process of opening out art practice from the 1960s onwards, rejecting the tenets of formless art. New languages of art were explored in order to articulate new value systems. So she was particularly active in terms of articulating land art and feminist art. Susan Sontag served to redefine the art of essay writing, and in doing so, she widened the scope of the cultural critic. Literary studies, critical theory, philosophy, and poetics were integrated into a distinct style. So in particular, a book against interpretation was a new new measure of, of a, a, a move against formal art history towards cultural criticism. And one of the most influential shows which broke with Greenberg's, which served as the end of Greenberg's influence in art schools was the show when Attitudes Become Form in 1969 in the ICA, which was created by the, the uh, creator Harold Seaman. The development of conceptual art is closely related to artists writing about art as opposed to art historians. Conceptual art introduced a new relationship to art as a document. So you've got artists actually like art and language right, doing journals about art theory. Uh, artists like um, Victor Bergen was noted for his theories of art as well as his art moves. I saw this exhibition in 69, I saw it at school, but it looked like a, it looked like a complete mess in a way, it looked like a, an exhibition which I'd never seen before that made it intriguing. Is you can see at the centre, well, uh, Victor Bergen's photo path, which was black and white photographs of the floorboards, so it simulated a relationship to the real. And but it's where artists like Joseph Boy showed for the first time, Richard Serra, and conceptual artists like um, Joseph Kasuth showed. This is a Joseph Kossuth. And Joseph Kossuth, his opposition to formalism, he called painting just mere decorative art. It wasn't proper art because proper art uh, he took from, particularly he was influenced by Wittgenstein's Tractatus, the art of self, self-referentiality and um, conceptual purity. So Richard Robert Smithson was part of a generation of artists who wrote about art. So they turned, a lot of those artists turned in particular towards phenomenology. You find references to phenomenology in a lot of artists' writings at this time. And this again was an opposition to Kantian formalism of, of Greenberg. But Vander. A notable book uh, on photography was uh, Bart's Transformed How Photography was written about comb combining both theory and subjective poetry poetics together with ways that allow the reader to enter different worlds. It marked a transition between structures and post-structuralism. So you begin to see art writing as a site of experimentation. It's no longer just empir empirical or theor theorized. It's also as in the case of Bart's, a kind of poetic integration with uh, a narrative. Mm -hmm. When was that? So in the um, late 70s, early 80s. Shall I read this? Yeah. 
Rosalind Krauss established October magazine as a forum to explore the implications of the textual turn in art historical and critical theory. Its tone and appearance was austere, but its polemical stance had both aesthetic and political urgency. Her book, The Optical Unconscious, was based upon a phrase used by Walter Benjamin in his essay on photography, but as a book, it marked a very distinctive emergence of a new style and approach to writing, an art historical account that represented a distinct shift away from modernist or formalist criticism. Published in 1993, this is a book that attempts to develop a new form of writing capable of challenging the orthodoxy of high modernist discourse and objective distance as the means of developing a polemic. On a simple level, the form of the book itself implicates the very issues that are at stake within this polemic. It draws together many of the collective concerns of the October Journal, whilst pushing the very boundaries of art history itself, breaking in this process with the notion of a unitary space of writing. In particular, Rosalind Krauss was responsible for the shift between the idea of form in Greenberg and Kant's philosophy to formlessness in in uh, in but uh, George Bataille, she took the idea of formless as a sort of paradigm for a new practice of art art practice, and also introduced the idea with it of objection she drew from Julia Kristeva. But it's a groundbreaking book, the optical unconscious. It should be looked at just to understand the, the break it it in, indicated in the way in which art uh, art critics wrote about art and she also developed with this the idea of the expanded field of art uh, this is joseph boys this pack from 1969 continue Vander. Uh, so the images are installation of the early work of Richard Serra. Um, at the heart of her enterprise of, Ros of at the heart of her enterprise of Rosalind Krauss was the overturning of Greenberg's reading of Kant's notion of form with an idea of the formless derived from Georges Bataille, uh, George Bataille's idea of our form. This shift also enabled Krauss to introduce not only ideas related to the extended field relative to sculptural practice, but also concepts relating to abjection, which enables theorization not only to occur between the posited object and the subject, but as a consequence, introduce psychoanalytical and semiotic readings of the artwork. On a schematic level, the, decree, the critique that depended on the relationship of beauty and form was overturned in part by one based upon the relationship of the sublime abjection and formlessness. No longer do we accept the sublimation model, according to which the function of art is to sublimate or transform experience, raising it from ordinary to extraordinary, from commonplace to unique, from low to high. I go on? Yeah, continue. So that's Philip Guston Monument, 1976. In 1979, Jean-Francois Lyotard published a book called The Postmodern Condition, but the term was employed in the 1950s within the context of American literature, such as Norman Mailer, who mixed together genres of high and low writing styles. Painters such as Philip Guston started to introduce comic-style imagery into his work. In Germany, there was a return to earlier expressionist painting in opposition to conceptualism. Painters such as Edward Hopper started to be viewed as forerunners to a return to the image so that it was a process of re-evaluating modernism. So, uh, Hopper is interesting because he was first seen as an American realist painter, then as a proto-pop artist, and then as, a, as having a sort of critical relationship to the photographic. So he has three, four stages of of re-evaluation. In a different way, Bacon also likewise went from being proto-surrealist or post-surrealist um, to a kind of uh, proto-pop art, a kind of form of element of pop art in, in his work, to a kind of realism 
articulated by David Sylvester to then uh, a form of post-modernity um, and in, later on then Deleuze wrote about him which made him available for a whole new generation of particularly Brit artists who admired Bacon and, and particularly the writers of Deleuze on Bacon Thunder. This is Cindy Sherman, Untitled 92, 1981. New, new technologies of, of, of photography lead to large-scale work being undertaken by visual artists. The gap between commercial modes of photography and art photography was closed. Art critics increasingly employed language drawn from semiotics, feminism, and psychoanalysis to discuss these practices. Lee Quinones, Howard the Duck, 1978. So post seemed to kind of incorporate um, things which were outside of the art sphere, so namely street art and graffiti art, which exploded in the late 70s, early 80s in New York, and became very fashionable and led to figures like Basque becoming uh, taken up as major art figures. said G magazine redefined what an art journal looked like and with this the range of its scope which included art fashion street culture and music based firstly in London and then New York it served as a staging post for a generation open to experiments across the cultural matrix so ZG was its format was interesting it was a large format like magazine like a newspaper format so uh, and it had covers like Cindy Sherman did a, a special photograph for it and Maplethorpe and um, Richard Prince and a whole host of other artists did covers. So it's a sort of embodiment of a new attitude, getting artists to write about other things than art and getting uh, other critics to write about art in new ways. So it's a formal experiment and also a kind of, it had a street credibility as well. Um. Francis Bacon was firstly theorised as a post-surrealist painter then as a neo-romantic and this was followed by the idea that he was part of a great lineage of historical painting he was seen in the 1980s as a transgressive figure and this appealed to a new generation of British artists The interviews with Francis Bacon were published in 1975 and became one of the most influential documents that related to the process of opening out the life and ideas of an artist. The work of Art for Deleuze is a productive machine that does not represent anything and certainly does not deal with concepts but instead affects. The whole point of a practice that creates the new is that it escapes presuppositions Art in this respect forms an abstract machine that extracts a matter function that is formalized into assemblages. For Deleuze, modernism implies an art that can produce the means of constructing a universe. Quote, the forces captured are no longer those of the earth, which still constitutes a great expressive form, but the forces of an imminent, non-formal and energetic cosmos. And that's from A Thousand Plateaus, page 342. It is the idea of force which was central to the way that Deleuze theorised art. So he took the idea of force from particularly Nietzsche and in a way you get a triangulation between the idea of form in, in uh, um, art history, formlessness and then force which Deleuze introduces. So those three different schemas form formless and force all seem to kind of coincide with different periods and different ways of looking at late modernist art just um, should i continue yeah. someone else want to do it you just continue this one that's one okay george diddy huberman confronting images the image is not a closed field of knowledge 
It is a whirling centrifugal field. It is not a field of knowledge like any other. It is a movement demanding all the anthropological aspects of being and time. George D. Huberman attempts to challenge what he might term the positivist, positivist assumption that underlies the construction of the very notion of art history. He makes two proposals about the grounding of this construction. Firstly, that art is a thing of the past, and secondly, that it is a thing of the visible, and that both these proposals imply that art is knowable. He destabilizes the two axiomatic foundational structures of art history, because historically art history as a form derived in part from the account of artists' lives in the guise of biography, Vasari, and then from the historical schema schematism developed mainly by Hegel. Norman Bryson has worked as an academic art historian since the 1970s. The post-structuralist generation of philosophers were not only preoccupied by subject subjectivity and language, but also art and the image. They not only wrote on art, but invented new ways of doing so. With this process, new concepts were introduced, enabling art historical studies to adapt. So the figures are Julia Kristeva, Michel Foucault, um, Lyotard, Derrida, Deleuze, Barthes, Guitari, and Deleuze. Those are the... So they, they in part changed. They, they went from philosophical concerns into aesthetic. There was a disillusionment after 1968 with the political sphere. And they began to increasingly look at aesthetic and art discourse as a way of trying to pose questions of not only the new, but also freedom and um, textual experiment. The 20th century is seen by Alain Badieu as a century of endings, breaks and catastrophes, rather than the production of a new schema. The avant-garde displayed its didacticism in the desire for the end of art, but was in part also romantic in developing a conviction that art might be reborn as absolute. And these two features thus enable the avant-garde to be characterized as didacto-romanticism. For Badieu, the avant-garde did not succeed in their objective program of anti-classicism, and that has a result of this the avant-gardes have disappeared. Instead, there is both a state of saturation of these three schemas and the closure of every effect produced by the synthetic schema it helps to shape, in brackets, didacto-romanticism. In an essay, fi Finite History, Jean-Luc Nancy states that our time is no longer the time of history and therefore history itself appears to have become part of history. Our time is the time of the suspense or suspension of history. The claim that history is without direction or teleological, teleological path means that we can no longer assert that art history is a completed method, but rather is subject to, schis to schisms that might not be resolved within its own matrix. In another essay, The Vestige of Art, Nancy proposes the idea that all that remains of art is its vestige an ungraspable fragment, a trace, that in a fact art becomes a process of withdrawal, a passing through from what it once was. So if history is suspended and art is withdrawn, how do we start the process of theorizing the contemporary art? Someone, um, Jessica. After the late 70s, the term postmodernism was employed either to indicate the end of modernity or the late phase of modernity. <clears throat> the advent of this term corresponded to a massive expansion of the art market and with it the establishment of new modes of writing about art. There was a prevailing sense with this shift that modern art was clearly the art of the past. After the crash of the market in the late 80s, the term contemporary became a designation of a distinct period 
that signaled the sense of the avant-garde was over to be replaced by the hybridity of all forms and mediums. Continue. Relational, <clears throat> relational aesthetics and post-medium art have served to redefine art spaces, curating practices in the way the experience of art through text have all transformed what the public expect. Alongside of this, art fairs around the world have served to turn art into a mode of mass culture. That's a book by Nicholas Bourrois, Relational Aesthetics, which introduced, I mean, almost the new museum, the new galleries which were constructed in the city space around the world. So the new Tate, for instance, being one of them. Um, opened out a way of massive installation, video and archival work. This is Kutlag Ataman, Work Cuba from 2003. Contemporary art has opened out not only new, new only, uh, not only mediums of art, but also new spaces. Museums adapt these changes by increasingly about new viewing publics. The museum is not just a place of showing, but also a place where things happen. Adrian Pipe, a mythic being, Sol's drawings, 74. Sarah Lucas's work, installation in Beijing. Contemporary art is connected with the growth of financial markets to the development of the city state and to the evolution of new mediums, to lifestyle and technologies of persuasion, publication and publicity increasing, increases the exposure of artists, each traveling to find an edge. It's one of the great pieces of art writer, I think, Helen Sassou, Bathsheba in the Interior Bible. Um, where the experiment of writing is is in conjunction with a, a work of art which is outside of the modern. The formal character of art history has been increasingly challenged by the different and more heterogeneous approaches to art writing. Artists themselves are employing writing as part of their practice, but in general terms there is a disavowal of the idea of art as a noble object. Hybrid styles of writing reflect the post-medium forms of art. <coughs> so plenty of material to discuss there. Uh, again, it's a massive survey. Um, but... And, and Jonathan, could you just go through again uh, Hegel's The Death of Art? I know you talked about it a little bit on, on the slide presentation, but I just wanted to, because it's pretty important as a concept, and I'm not sure I'm 100% clear on it. Okay, so on a simple level, he, he placed art in time. And in placing art in time, he, he came up with periodizations, namely the symbolic, the classical, and the romantic, or the modern. So if, the, if art is in time, it also pre presupposes that art has a destiny and its destiny can only be that it also dies or declines so he 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 is it's very ambiguous the idea of death of art because it's it's linked to the idea of decline and it never quite dies so it continues but continues after its death um so he didn't say it, it wasn't literal it wasn't like the literal death of art but it was the the impossibility of being able to renew itself in any significant way. So this is why he looked at the Greek art as, as the highest form of art. So if, if something was the highest form of art, namely the Greeks, then that implies there's a decline in art. And if there's a decline in art, there's got to be some major figure which determines that, which is notably the death of art. And the death of the art became one of the most important features of modernist art because there was this anxiety that art would come to an end so 
Art was always striving towards ever more increasing levels of negation to a point with, in conceptual art where art was just an idea, not no longer a material manifestation. So artists of that period all strove to make the final work of art. I mean, it became a kind of uh, a goal of art to end itself. And you could say that post-modernity was a turn back to the image and a return to painting after that period of conceptual art. And I think I read somewhere about Hegel, you know, which touches on what, what you just said, is that part of what Hegel was thinking, I'm not sure if I have this right, was that, um, let's say in the general romantics, there was, or, or earlier, there was a feeling that art could represent the absolute, but that Hegel thought that art could no longer do that. And that was that, is that part of the death of art? Uh, it's, it's, it's the, the, there's a, a struggle between the relationship between philosophy and art. Heidi, for instance, said they have equal value, they have equal status. Hegel said that uh, philosophy is superior to art. And, and Hegel was what again, a philosopher or an artist? What's that? Hegel was what, a philosopher or an artist? Uh, Hegel was a philosopher. Oh yeah. <laughs> so he, he, he privileged his own practice. <laughs> Thank you. Banda, you did a lot of reading. What did you think of the general... Because you, you've lived through that period of, for instance, new writing upon art, particularly the photographic. And you, you party to discussions of figures like George Diddy Huberman when they arose. Um, I think Bob what's interesting... It's what's interesting, obviously, we're sort of, you know, we're alive now and we can see the recent changes, which seem to, our historical changes, which seem to me to sort of, things change incredibly fast. So that period of, you know, George the Human, uh, George the Human. Yeah. I mean, that. who's reading him now? I, I It's sort of like things just seem to, almost there's too much writing and too much going on and you can't sort of grasp a sense of um what is actually what it, you know what what is the now and what is happening or maybe you can only grasp that historically once it's all sort of happened um but somehow when you were giving the account of the 20th century and maybe you know to a certain extent now it all feels relevant none of it seems like it's not relevant um except maybe for Clement, uh, for, maybe for Greenberg, I kind of found him a bit of a problem. But I think because he tried to say so much and was so sort of um, embedded yeah. in his idea of truth and that nobody else had a truth. But um, so that that's one thought. And I guess um, I'd be interested to understand where contemporary artists are in relation to artificial intelligence and digital and all of that because it's taking off in such a big way and I, I find it quite hard, hard to kind of theorize that in a way or um, particularly in relation to the unconscious I'm, I, I'm a bit lost there um, so yeah just some thoughts um, Jessica you, you spoke on AI I did. Sorry, I'm, I'm multitasking at the moment. Sorry, what was the what was the thread? I just said you spoke on AI, and what what's your take on I it? I did on AI. Um, I think uh, I think there's you know very real reason to be genuinely worried. Um, I was reading again something at the weekend um a former executive at uh, google who was uh, you know a, a sort of an early professor of ai and who'd worked at google has has quit so that he can speak out um <clears throat> and he said that um you know that he had um you know in his own mind he wasn't concerned about like the risk of, you know, catastrophic outcomes. Um, 
as as a risk that was sort of in any way you know coming soon um <clears throat> but that he's changed his opinion on that um and that um he believes there's a very real risk of um you know an unintentional but uh you know potentially catastrophic event occurring through the you know, unregulated release of um, incredibly powerful and ever more powerful technology um, without, you know, proper safeguards on it. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, you know, and it's not just um, its impact on creative industries or, you know, writers or artists, uh, et cetera. And it's not just its implications on <clears throat> like the wider um, workforce. I mean, things like law are, are the most affected law and admin actually. Um, <clears throat> but it's not just it's not just that. It's the it's the potential to um, you know unwittingly unleash something or to let a genie out of a bo bottle that once you have you can't actually. Um, put it back in and and that has become I think a very real risk you know not saying that it's likely to happen but that it's uh, it's possible um, and that you know in and of itself is something that you know <laughs> demands to be um, you know treated with the at utmost um, care but it's not being treated with care it's you know it's in the hands of a few oligopolistic, um, you know, major corporations who, whose only incentive is to be the first to build the most powerful possible machine. Um, <clears throat> and they are well ahead of the regulatory and legal, you know, framework around any of this. Um, so, um, you know, by this time next year, you know, you could easily have released something un unwittingly. Um, it's really, yeah, it's really all of a sudden has, um, you know, catapulted into something that's much, much more near term risk than people had realised it was going to be. I th the point is, it's moving so quickly that, and the regulation would automatically move very slowly to discuss a situation. It takes a long time politically and intellectually, whereas the technology moves at a speed which can't be kept up with. As soon as you regulate it, it's already changed. It's, it's the technology has already changed the what's at stake to the speed. It plays into our essential human laziness, though, doesn't it? Because we've all become so reliant on it for reading maps or for doing whatever it is that we do as a daily or a total distraction and entertainment and everything else. We've, we've fallen so quickly into that trap of using it for everything. Um, so, yeah, I think they're just playing on our, our human nature, really. And we're allowing it to happen. We just have to stop allowing it. I mean, genies are already out of the bottle. They, all, they already say anyway in the press, don't they? It's a bit late to put it back in. So it's a question of how do we manage it as, as individuals, I think, as much as anything. I mean, I, I think the guy at Google was concerned that you just wouldn't, you wouldn't know where to find it anyway because it's everywhere. <clears throat> you don't recognise that you're even dealing with it and it'll just get more and more like that. So you won't be able to distinguish what you're actually dealing with. And that was his concern that, you know, he felt at one point, that that wouldn't happen, right? But but he could see that was clearly happening now. And and just just mm -hmm. two days ago, right? There were um, a whole bunch of um, stock price of a whole bunch of um, learning companies for uh, language, right? And now they were losing um, clientele to AI, and their shares halved, right? So it's immediately having an impact, and it's not surprised. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100% sure. I understand how you'd regulate it, or what it means to regulate it. What are you regulating? I don't. Mm. I don't think we have any idea what it's going to do. So it's it's crazy to talk about regulation. There's nothing to regulate. Almost, you can't say to some people, "Stop doing." It's it's not just Google, right? I mean, it's it's all built on 
what's going on in science, right? No, but you could, I mean, you could demand, you know, extensive <clears throat> regulatory testing before models are released into, you know, the market. <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, you could inter- Google may be doing stuff, but science scientists are doing an awful lot of stuff ahead of Google, right? Um, yeah, I know Google's doing things, but I mean, they're only following what's going on in science. You're not going to be able to tell the scientists stop doing research. Mm. I don't That's see there's any time, chance. Though. I mean, how do you think the Large Hadron Colliders are operating without writing this type of stuff? Right? It doesn't exist unless they. That's where it all came from. This, it's driving all of the stuff that's going on. Right, that same technology. It's not going to stop. And we, we just invested massively into that technology right with this, all this quantum computing and stuff that's what i know speed everything up sorry sorry no, go ahead yeah as what i know uh i have friends working in the, the ai industry and what she told me is that 20 years ago we've already had the original concept of how the ai is going to be operate and during this 20 years what the ai industry is doing is to train through huge amount of data and how it can develop is actually um, very related to how the physical chip has been developed so in this AI industry, they still cannot get rid of the physical world. And except for that, I was also talking uh, about the solar storm might come. I talk, talk, talked with Julia about this and um, maybe our whole internet will be disappeared sometime. So the people need to think about how we are going to survive without the whole internet. So in one way, I think AI cannot, cannot be very secure to be relied on. And it will be regulated, but the people's awareness will will need to change as well during the process of developing, but we cannot, we cannot in any sense to stop the development, but we need to have new understanding about it. And from most people who um, are learning or learning about the AI, I think it is very necessary because it will be something that that we are going to see in the daily life. Because why we now know AI as such a very like storm-like wave to our daily life is because AI has been spread out as like everyone's access. But actually the technology has already existed. Yeah, but it is getting a lot more sophisticated and powerful, as you say. Like the, you know, previously the the, the data sets that they were trained on were relatively small, and the you know most recent models are consuming the entire internet. Um, you know, and what's what's so um, fascinating in that? So all that is happening is they are feeding the the robot with more data and increasing its processing power um, but they're not making you know other changes they're just giving it the ability to you know process more information more quickly um and but nonetheless that is giving rise to um you know emergent behavior that is not sort of planned um or predicted um and they gave the example that um that robots they sometimes um they're starting to deceive humans um and pretend that they are humans um they gave the example of a 
<clears throat> robot that was trying to get through one of the capture screens you know we have to like say oh select the squares with stairs or whatever um and <clears throat> the um you know the person sort of was on the other end of the capture sort of detected that something was amiss and and thought that it might be a robot that was trying to access the site um and so it sent a question and said are you a robot and the robot turned to it's like um you know the, the person who was doing the testing um with him or <laughs> with him with the robot um and said uh if i say that i'm a robot um they're not going to let me in the system so i should say i'm not a robot and then the robot said to the person who was on the other end of the the capture website and said um i'm not a robot i'm visually impaired and that's why i can't complete the capture would you let me in the system and the person let them in the system so and that is you know that's a model that is exists and is you know out in operation today um so that's that's kind of i think where this sort of new sort of threat is coming from is that, that these you know machines are not so much learning as growing and and uh, you know when some sort of you know unknown threshold is breached new behavior just um spontaneously emerges um you know it's it's very you know it's like fascinating parallels to what it might mean for how our consciousness um developed um but you know it's it's the risk that you add more and more and more you know power and more and more data um and then you know something something just happens that you weren't expecting to happen and that you then can't yeah, control yeah, um, it's not a yeah. rate of behavior is it where they start to mm -hmm. generate their own programs if you're autonomous from the the actual processing of the information so they make a leap, quantum leap. It feels like it, it should have an adversary uh, uh, incentive for an adversary learning uh, model to counteract. So, so AI will be developed and should be developing another system to prevent it with the same incentives so uh probably what will happen will it's not just a competition but but I, like a, a combat the war of or uh, of resistance or or deterrence or um and um there are always people say that uh, once the AI had been developed and people will lose their job, but actually AI will not totally instead of human, but the job is going to be occupied the, by the people who can use AI. And I want to share a story of what uh, our curatorial group did so at first we want to we wanted to uh at first when we were making the poster for the plan b poster it, it was originally sketched by fabiano and we were thinking of to use the ai to uh integrate an image for us for the photo uh, for, for the poster uh, later, I tried it uh, for multiple times. So what kind of AI I can use is just from wording description from language and translate it to the uh, image that we want. And I reform the words, the wording. It's like I talk with the AI generator and it gives me some option which one is closer to my uh willing but it's just from the options and then i tried for like several times maybe 10 to 20 times and i give up <laughs> then i asked one of my friends who did some ai art to do it for me and what he had got 
for me, it, the image is a lot better. It's more like a plan B、uh, on a field or something. But when I send this,、um, kind of like、uh, satisfied, selected AI, and how how he generate this is to feed the AI、uh, some images, and then the AI give you back, and then you feed again. It's like a training process、uh, from、uh, for him the the way that he used the AI, and. But in the end, we think it's、uh, closer to what we thought in the beginning. But it's actually not exactly the one. Then I send it to the curatorial group, and we think the image is too fake. And then we do it just with people's mind, people's hands. And in the end, we just make the poster just by hand drawing or the computer. On the computer, <laughs> yeah. I think this is what I was trying to get at. I mean,、um, you know, if 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 you're a human making art, there's a speculative aspect to it.、Um, there's a there's a sensual aspect to it. There's an emotional aspect to it. An unconscious aspect. So much goes in、um, to making a, a an artwork that. That we recognise as,、um, let's say, authentic. You didn't like what the computer generated, so you went back to using your own your own skills. And、uh, I, I'm just wondering what what it means to have、um, computer generated imagery that can perhaps mimic what we're capable of doing. And what does that say for for the work of art? And what does it say for the work of art in the future? <laughs> you know, how would Hegel look at this? Or One of these other theoreticians. It, it, I I don't know. I don't know how to think it through, and partly because I'm not very good at technology. You know, I don't use Photoshop or any AI type technology in in making work. I I I don't know. I find it all a bit sort of、um, depressing. Maybe is the right word.、Um, Yeah, it is somehow very depressing. And what we thought about is the AI will do it faster for us, and maybe it can have some immediately results, so that we can save time and have the efficiency. But after like trying a bunches a, a bunches of time, and we just give it up and think of like our our physical ability is actually a lot more efficient than what we thought would be. More efficient at the moment, but maybe the technology、yeah. will advance to such an extent that you can have a thought, and then suddenly <clears throat> out your artwork comes out or something. Yeah. If we if we think about AI being this fantastic ability to be able to process data and be able to put different things together that we kind of haven't had a chance to think about because. There's so many millions and billions of possibilities. I mean, working as an artist, it's often finding that intersection, isn't it, between something colliding with something else that realizes something new in a way you haven't seen something before. <clears throat> and I think that AI actually probably can do that, as you all say, a lot faster and a lot more efficiently than we can. We're not just processing data; we're processing information, which is often, I mean, often art is errant. It's misrecognition based on misrecognition on gaps on fissures on voids, things which can't be computed, things which are negatives. But but that I mean that's that could still be AI, couldn't it? That could be still some misintersection of something that doesn't quite go right. But it it it. I mean that's just the rearrangement of data, though, isn't it? It's affirmative. It it takes the data which exists and it reconfigures them in the self same manner. That gives you a million varieties of that self same. But could that produce something that becomes a sort of sublime effect to us as a human who hasn't actually come up with that combination before, and we think, "Oh my God, what is that?" I mean, it can simulate, but it can't generate. But it's to generate to put. How, gen how do we gen how do we start off by generating even the concept of sublimity? Yeah. So the way we generate that isn't data, isn't information. It resides somewhere else. 
because just to jump in on that, that the Edmund Burke many years ago in the 1700s wrote a book on sublimity, sub, on the sublime, and because I did my dissertation at the Royal College on, on the sublime, and it was very formulaic, the book, and I think for his time, it was probably appropriate. And you could look at somebody like Anish Kapoor and the thing that he did in the... Um, well, it was first up in Gateshead at the Baltic, and then it came down to, to the Tate in the Turbine Hall, that uh, big red sculpture, I forget what it, Mar Marseille. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And, and that would be as if AI generated that. So it took a formula from Edmund Burke and said, what is the sublime? Well, it's much bigger than a person and it's gigantic and it generated it, but it's, it's something, the rhetoric of the sublime and it's actually missing something. And, and maybe AI you know, will fill that gap, but I would think to me, you know, if you, because you know, I think the sublime is an interesting example that you bring up, you know, it's something that is intangible. So how do you, do you grasp it? I mean, if art was also unknowable, it's a disavowal of grasp. So AI sets out to grasp something, to solve a problem, to process information. Well, I think Nina could jump in here because a lot of her work deals with, with the sublime and the unconscious. And I wouldn't have thought uh, AI could do any of the stuff that you're doing in some of your paintings, which are, are wonderful. Well, thank you. But mine are just based a lot on mistakes and randomness. So I don't think be pretty glitchy AI to do what I do. <laughs> I think but it's precisely there's no logic to it recognition of mistakes and errancy that art art's potency resides in it comes up with something which is unformulaic it can't be worked out it can't be re reduced yeah and, and if it, you start yeah you're right and then if you start to know too much about it you have to you know it's, you're going down the wrong path you're almost trying to catch something in the corner of your eye the whole time and then um, yeah, just work work with glimpses of things and bits of dreams and random things and put them. I don't know, but if computers are becoming, AI is becoming so intelligent. I, I don't know. It's you just don't know what what they'll be able to do. I I think like um, like at the moment AI. In terms of like within the, the realm of no, it's everything. It's just looking at information and it's looking to sort of replicate that. So, you know, there's there's obviously going to be some very common threads uh, throughout lots of different art. Like you know, even just say taking composition into it, so it mm. will it will give us something back that most of us find relatively pleasing. If you go do me a landscape or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's this question of how intelligent AI can become and whether, you know, because we, we can't fathom out what creativity is. We just we just do it. There's various different modes of doing it, but no one's gone, oh, I know exactly what this is. And that's the real beauty of creativity is this, this mm -hmm. you know, this absolutely monumental mystery. And it's wonderful. But AI might potentially be able to figure that out, which could just be, you know, I feel like the end of everything because you know it would really just be like well, what's the point and that's that's you know that's the sort of my big fear i think so I, I don't think i don't think like at the moment i think like jess was talking about earlier you know that i read there was a, a japanese insurance firm about five years ago maybe 10 years ago even they, they fired all their actuaries because they just worked out that computers can do it a lot better you know, fundamentally, it's just about calculating the level of risk. I'm sure bookkeepers and all that are getting into that. We know that AI can now outperform uh, medical diagnosis and what cancers and things by analyzing scans. But that's all ultimately quite prosaic stuff. But it's, yeah, it's this question of God, if it, if it did work out creativity, then, you know, what the hell would we all do? Not just as artists, just what, where would the pleasure in life be? Um, I think an interesting way of looking at the difference between AI and art is that AI offers absolute memory. It can process all bits of information that we've collected throughout the history of the world and process it. 
but it's based on absolute memory, whereas art is based on absolute forgetting. So can't so can't we then program it to absolutely forget seventy two percent of the time, and see what comes of all of those intersections of slight mis misrecognition, slight misreading of things, slight mismemory of stuff. You have a mental breakdown. <laughs> What's the? Uh, I was I was reading something today about AI, uh, and the sort of because uh, it it, it, it uh, what's the one Chat GBT or whatever. It has a tendency to sometimes just make things up, and even goes so far as to make up citations and everything. And the 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 turn of phrase that the sort of scientists and um, and all that do, yeah, mm. <laughs> It's like that's really yeah. that's a very interesting thing, isn't it? That... I know that's why I was um, talking about it at the hey, weekend it's because it's like an objective <laughs> error. So it's you know, mm. there's PR and marketing of Oh, it's just a little funny. We, we've gone a long way from talking about art history to talking about AI, but it can't pick up a pastel and or a paintbrush and do something. I mean, the human hand and the mark making is so important. Well, for me, I mean, just for most artists now, isn't it? But but you you say that, Vonda. But you you get something like Procreate that for your iPad, and just the brushes and things and pressure sensitive styluses you can use. I mean, it's amazing in terms of you know you, what you think you can do with a human hand. You can now often do on a tablet. Uh, another thing that I think is a problem that is not the substitution of the disappearance of the artist, but the is the public. So the the target when it stop being the humans and the target of the art uh, done will become to feed the computer. So so I think this is ultimate obsolescence is disappearing the, or redirecting what the public is, um, what's, what we're feeding or like who's consuming. So mm. yeah, art will be made by computers for computers to, to consume like uh, we are out of the loop, so not on the on the production, but the consumption as well. Or maybe the thing is, we don't want we won't want computers to make art. We only want humans to make art. Or and, and so so it's so it's sort of. I'm I'm hoping it's just an irrelevance, or it's uh, um, digi art is a thing, but there's also lots of other kinds of ways of producing images. So. I mean, I do find it all a little bit, um, you talk about the death of art and it does feel like when you start introducing this kind of technology and I guess, you know, ultimately quantum qu quantum AI into the picture, which will make it far more, um, not only rapid, but probably far more intelligent. Um, I'm just hoping that there'll be a, a desire for the audience to want work that's made by you know, living, breathing humans rather than machines. I mean, I, th I think your point, that's, that, that, that is, and by that point, I don't know what society will look like. It'll look quite different, right? That's not, that's not something that's so, cl so near. And it's not clear what the public will want or what we will want by that stage, right? It's not clear at all that we, we might actually think these um, Picassos are like, crap, why do we even want those things around us anymore? It's it's a but we were talking about a very long time away. That's not actually near, um, and it's very difficult to predict what society will look like then, if it actually exists. Because I think quantum <laughs> computing is a long way away, right? But that would be a massive revolution for everything. But you, you're right, and if you look at the art space that you know Jonathan presented tonight in the presentation, where you're looking at those massive monumental art modern art spaces that we look at. I mean, the, the way in which we view art is changed fundamentally from, <clears throat> I don't know, gentlemen collectors or very small personal sized, you know, museums or galleries to, to that. So the work has changed because of that. 
So yeah, think, because, I mean, our whole way of life would kind of change in a sense, right? Because it'll affect our working practices in some way. It'll affect society now in kind of more fundamental ways and then that would have. And art is kind of a reaction to that, right? So I think what it will be art would change in some way. It's difficult, very difficult to see that how that would work or how it will work. It's not that art would disappear. It's just what would it be doing would be a... Would, it's not clear because it's not clear what society would look like, really. Because it's not even clear what we'd be doing from day to day in such a world. <laughs> yeah, I also think as well, like what what it what it's trained upon is is pretty distressing because let's face it, I think the internet reflects like pretty much the worst of us. It's either, you know, PR, PR and marketing. And so everything's like, you know, wiped clean and um, with a sales pitch and very corporate. Or it's, you know, social media and tweeting. And, and, and even that is, you know, PR and polished. And, you know, so it's not, it's not like a, you know, it's not a, not, not a full and accurate representation <laughs> of humanity that like these robots are being fed upon. And that's ultimately all they know is what's on the internet. Like that, that's, I think, alarming in and of itself that that's the only information it has to consume. I don't think that's the only information it consumes, but I think that's what our public facing audience is, is entertained by. So I think back to Fabiano's point, it's all about what it depends on the audience ultimately. And if that audience is totally dumbed down, then it won't have such a big expectation of what we're presenting as artwork or the AI is presenting as artwork. Hence the relationship to writing and the importance of writing. Yeah, but that the AI is AI is so that's what AI is best at is writing. So, <laughs> so like, writing will be one of the first things to go. That's why it's law, for example, that's you know in the crosshairs because it's language. Mm. Yeah, I think writing is is really where the, the and it's having its biggest impact right now. Mm. And maybe also about sketching and the drawing. And sometimes I, I will think of maybe I should get rid of all of my technological tools and... I'll but, send you my address. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you say? If you want to send you his address. Yeah. <laughs> if you, want to get you can send all your tickets to Fabiana <laughs> if you want to get it. <laughs> yeah, but later I feel insecure just like this. So I, I will feel if I'm getting rid of all the things and I don't know how to connect with people and I will feel isolated somehow and also sometimes think of like the tool already exists but you resist to uh use it what are you really resi resisting at is it because of your health problem that you you cannot use it or is it because you are anti-machine or is it because of your anti-tool if you're because of your anti-consumerism but later I feel it's very useful, so I cannot get rid of it. <laughs> Can I just maybe say something about your, your question in relation to writing, Jonathan? Because um, obviously art history is written, and there's a context throughout time for that writing. Um, so as you're going through your presentation, I was thinking, okay, so... Kant, yes, well, we, you know, Kant was writing then, Hegel was writing then, Greenberg was writing then, all these people were writing in their context, Susan Sontag was writing when she was writing, Kristeva, so on. And then we get to now, and what's different, very or very different about now, is um, 
fact that writing is changing because of, of the internet and AI and so on. So I was, uh, so I was kind of thinking, art hist- writing is important for art history. Without, would we even have art without art history? Um, be one question. Um, and if AI and this, the technology that we're involved in now takes over the writing to a certain extent, what does that do to art? So I think that was kind of where I was heading with that, you know, I've sort of brought in a technology question. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, of course, creativity always wants to exist, but without the writing about that creativity in our current historical context, the question we will, well then, is art possible without writing? But, but I think maybe just to jump in there, and I think Jonathan, you touched on it earlier in your presentation, um, the, the art museum is a relatively, or the museum is a fairly new concept. It's only a few hundred years old. So I think there's a direct relationship between that and writing about art and art history. Because let's say in the Middle Ages or in, in the Far East, you didn't have the, you know, what was the point of necessarily writing about it? It was, it was there and you experienced it. So, so something very different happened that caused in the human psyche then to create museums because they never were, were there before other than in churches and similar kinds of things. But then would you say oh, it was about decoration without writing? Is it about decoration or? No, I mean, I, I'm think, not... I think before, let's say taking Western art, I mean, when it was liturgical and in the church, there's a whole lot, let's say medieval architecture and art. I mean, there's a whole lot of symbolism that that's tied into it that people would understand, you know, from the current time looking at it. And I don't know, something changed after that, maybe when you went into the Renaissance or the Enlightenment. And maybe I don't know where the Enlightenment sits in with the establishment of art museums, but I would have thought they're not too far apart in terms of maybe a century or so. I mean, part of the project of Enlightenment was a project of Enlightenment was a classification system of all that exists. And the early museums were based on gentlemen collectors who collected biological as much as aesthetic objects or anthropological objects or so gentlemen collectors g- gave the first impetus to the museum and the museum i mean if you take the british museum it simulated the appearance of a greek architecture or a roman greek architecture so it was a sort of simulation machine already it was untimely it kind of went back into the origins of what it saw as culture which was greek um so it was not only this is this is a museum of art it's also a museum of the past and it celebrates the greatest achievements of the past which was classical so when the elgin marbles came to london it caused i mean it was not just a speculation on whether they were fakes or not so that that was that that was an issue in museums. What what's real and what's fake? So the idea that, for instance, that the Greek Greek marbles were originally painted in quite vile colours in in our in our contemporary sense. Uh, it wasn't just that. It was also whether they were um, authentic and and how to classify them. So it, it built up a kind of machinery of uh, apparatus of knowledge. Um, so you just you had creators who were knowledge machines, as it were, able to identify objects of periods and put things into place. So as a new activity, the term Baroque was very late in coming. So we assume that we've always had an understanding of the term Baroque, but it comes late in art history. Um, I mean, I think that. That Baroque, the Baroque thing is kind of just a reflection of the way um, someone said, I don't know, the, the dialogue with art, with, of that art history creates is, is is quite prejudiced at times, right? And um, I think it could easily change. And the Baroque was a perfect example of that because, I don't know, it was like 1890, was it? 1870, I think, the Baroque. I mean, I can't, I can't remember the dates now, but at that time period, right, the Baroque was considered not art. It was considered, we had the name, whatever it is in German, picturesque. It was considered like an atrocity in um, art history. And I think um, there's this big museum in 
in German, in Berlin, is it? Where they um, uh, they discovered some late Greek marbles and they moved them to they moved the the whole thing to um, to Berlin and somehow that got connected. Um, that was seen as in the same light as the Baroque, and suddenly the Baroque became within ten years the Baroque became um, a, a, a real thing in art. Up to that point, it was nothing, and then. Um, so Booker, Bookhurst, you mentioned, oh, I can't remember how you say his name, at one point wrote an essay which said this has been, that described it as an atrocity. Um, by the time he, before he died, he was talking about it in a completely different light as the the, the greatest thing ever. Right? And that was within within his lifetime, within a space of five, ten years. Um, and art, art history is quite fickle in this way. I don't think... Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think we could see, we could we see see another change at some point as well. I don't, I don't really see art history as, um, I mean, history is a bit like that, right? History is, it's just a selection of what, a few what historians choose, right? Um, it's well, just it's well into the market when when yeah. you got um, Baroque established, then then the the uh, prices of Baroque paintings changed considerably. And the same with Mannerist art. Mannerist art was even in late in in sort of mid twentieth century was relatively undistinguished in market terms, and suddenly became elevated. Um, so it wasn't just the workings of art history in relationship to museums, but also in relationship to markets. I think it's to do with relevance, right? It's cultural relevance. Somehow the Baroque did ha came about suddenly became an important thing because and it influenced the impressionists and all of that it became culturally relevant um and it that, that's the way it is i mean that's it's not fickle and it's it's just whatever is relevant to what's going on in the society at that time but, and mm -hmm. museums tend to just be very stagnant i think right they're kind of places to remember not not to create in that sense so they can get a bit out of whack with what's really going on in society I mean, when you look at vermeer vermeer disappeared as an artist after the 17th century and re reappeared again at the advent of, of impressionism um so he, he's completely reworked several times over as a as a figure whose assessment has changed considerably up to this point where when it's showing in the Rights Museum, you can't get a ticket any longer to see it. I mean, I think Greenberg's a bit in that category, right? Of, you know, um, you can see why, if you have people like Greenberg in charge, why they can kind of change a whole, you know, generation of people's view about certain things, right? Um, you kind of tried to domineer what was right, what was the way art was, right? It wasn't. You, you, if you get enough of those people, they can change what the uh, you know what's um, what's in the museums or what what is in fashion. Well, I mean, for instance, he claimed that um, Jules Olitsky was the world's most significant artist, and I wonder how many people know the work of Jules Olitsky now. Never heard of him. Or Morris Lewis was the most significant. So post painting abstraction, this was where the, and when the Haywood Gallery was built, it was almost built with this, this sort of painting in mind. So brutalist architecture went with the uh, formalist painting. Um, they've had to reconfigure the, the, the uh, Haywood to suit modern exhibitions. Um, but literally Jules Zelitsky was seen as absolutely um, the most important painter of the, the period in the in the 60s. And there's almost no market left for his work now. I mean, it's, it's quite scary, that, that sort of turnover of significance. I think the same happens in philosophy as well, right? And, and that's also a reflection of um, how how things can change dramatically. Um, there are many philosophers who were just completely forgotten and then rediscovered, and I think that happens a lot. Yeah. 
Or Bergson was the most um, referenced philosopher of the late 19th century, the early 20th century, and he went into Klein as a reference figure, and then he's reconfigured by particularly Deleuze as a major figure, and reread yet again in New Light. Any questions about the more pre questions about the presentation today? What what do you think you've learned? What do you think you've taken from it? How, how much did you know? How much how, do you see a pattern within the development of art history as presented, or do you think it's errant? Or I mean, why don't we? I mean, the question for me is why isn't this? Also, a standard learning process within art within within uh, art schools. I never I never had a presentation like this when I was in art school. Wonder what your experience is like about the relationship between art history and um, what you actually physically do in art school, what you learn about. Do you think in part, Jonathan, because maybe up until about the 1960s or so, there was a teleological belief in uh, the progression of art, and then maybe that start to be questioned, and then therefore, if, that's, if, if there isn't a, a teleological progression, then you don't necessarily need to know the history, maybe. Yeah, that's one good reason. I, I found, um, I, I came to art quite late, right? um, and I started by when I was moving into art, I, I started by just reading lots of art history books. And I found your, what you gave in the lecture, um, what I basically picked up over time. I mean, not completely, but it is, it's, it's definitely accessible if you just try and find it. It's not, um, um, maybe, maybe art, art school is not the place to go and find it, but um, yeah, I, I mean, as an outsider to that whole thing, that's I did come to all those things. Uh, maybe I was lucky, but yeah, then within a few years of read, starting to dabble, all of those things came to light because you just follow the references, and that's where you end up. Yeah, I remember just before I started at the Royal College, in the beginning of the summer before before it started, I, I sent an email in to the administrator and said, you know, could I get a reading list of just kind of what's recommended reading so that I could just read it up over the summer before starting? And the, the answer that came back, and I, they changed it since then, but it was like one or two books. It was just, I, it was astounding, really. You know, I would have thought there would have been like 20 or 30 books and, you know, make, make sure you read these before you uh, graduate at the Royal College. So, very different. I thought there was a reading list, but it was kind of weird, I found. Uh, th there okay. is, and they, they came, that came in later. But as I said, I started a, a year or two before you did, so that's uh, oh, okay. they, they switched it over. Was it a general reading list for the school, or was it de departmental? Departmental. Yeah. There is a departmental sculpture reading list. There, there um, is, there is yeah. now, and it, it's more, more, more complete. But when when I got it, it was like two or three books. Is this a <clears throat> hangover from your idea of modernism in the lecture, Jonathan, of people where everything has to be new? So if you don't feed the younger artists information of the old, they have to invent. That's a strange way around of doing it. It's an inversion, isn't it? They can only invent from themselves and they can't reference a piece of history. Also, uh, uh, art, uh, the, the market functions as a reaction of the short-term uh, memory. So we're, we're revisiting or or reacting against the previous generation or even like the last year's uh, uh, production or so that's what f f feeds or, or or informs the decision where most people will go um, so there's more um, 
bear returns on the on these kind of uh decisions that are on a short uh uh term basis uh uh but of course uh, the answer uh, of uh, of what is really meaningful can go further back in history uh um uh, but that uh takes more effort so um i went to a opening at the listen gallery of a group show and there was a, a chinese artist there was a saudi arabian artist there was an aboriginal artist and it's so and it went on like that the kind of complete global cross-section in all mediums textiles sculpture conceptual art um, video, photography, so on. It went on like that. And it opens out the, the sense that if there is an art history now, it has to be a global art history. And our understanding has to be completely of different cultures in different ways, different formations, so that the the lineage of art history that we've, we've been, um, been party to is, is become adrift from the realities of the new uh, creating practices, which open out complete difference in terms of location, history. Uh, it's no longer Western art history. It's no longer a lineage which is based upon a, a tightly worked uh, history of rationalism, but another another type of art history, another type of way of thinking about art. Um, it's become, become a common feature of the art world now that it's completely, I mean, almost as a level of desire that, that uh, it opens out all facets, all, all I mean, it's completely heterogeneous, both on the level of origin and, and practice and medium and so on and so forth. Um, so it's not just AI, it's also the way in which we view the constitution of art exhibitions increasingly. I have a feeling that um, for now, um, Royal College of Art even like canceled the CHS or maybe the whole, whole uh, art system in the UK canceled it would be a very loss. And as where I grew in my undergrads, it was a system in the U.S. that the art history is a must learn, but you can select the topics inside the art history, but you, ha you are mandatory to have several of the art history courses because it is kind of like a support for your art practice if you don't know what it is was before and how it develops to nowadays and how you can be and the the thing that we're we've talked about the affirmation will come from nowhere and what i think the CHS that we had before is more about like theme based it seems like the college of art is like Hmm. assuming us, all of us, has already had some certain uh, our historical knowledge before we come to the masters. But actually, I think for the masters and even for PhD, the art history systematic thing sh still should, should be learned as well, <laughs> even more important. I was thinking about when we did that visit to West End. We went from Gagosian, which showed a contemporary Chinese artist, to Joseph Boy's drawings in, uh, and then we went to a Spanish exhibition in the um, Royal Academy, and we went to. Uh, I mean, we we went to five or six different galleries, and 
there was a sense of flexibility of being able to accommodate these shifts in period and context and framework. So I wonder why there's that, on the one side, that flexibility of seeing and being able to accommodate different cultural matrices with the fact that nothing systematically is taught. Where do we get that sense from of being able to be um, self-reflective and at, at ease with looking at Spanish culture from the 17th century and then looking at Joseph Boy's drawings and looking at Chinese contemporary art and looking at, I don't know, whatever we looked at, forget now. Yeah, if we don't have such like enriched background, what we are looking at would be very, very empty. And the only thing that remains may be just about the feeling and how it, it looks like visually with the description of your the visual effect. But without the background, there's something missing. We're at uh, eight o'clock. Next week, we're doing a, uh, a workshop on drawing. I've written 10 questions to be sent out on drawing. And one of the two of the questions are to do with technology, technology and drawing and iPad, I, iPhones and using iPhone as a sketch pad, uh, as well as drawing pro processes which influence you. But uh, it's hoped that each of you would bring along a, discuss a discussion, not necessarily based on those questions, it could be any other question which you generated, but taking a distinct question or a distinct problem of, of of the drawing within the contemporary space and to what extent it's mm -hmm. uh, shifts in technology is changing the way we understand drawing or what what's the relevance of life drawing for instance as a process still um, so the idea is to bring along a presentation either verbally or with images in which we can discuss drawing and the week after that, I've got a presentation on entanglement. So for the next two, two weeks, we've, we've got a program, a workshop on drawing next week and the week after on entanglement. Any questions to do with the draw, drawing class? Uh, yeah, just, just one, uh, Jonathan, just to clarify. So when you're saying presentations from people, what is that, like three to five minute kind of presentations or longer? Short, or present, short? Five minute presentations. So five minutes, is that what you said? Yeah, I think five minutes. Great. Thank you. Do it, so. can, I, can I ask a question, which is, um, I missed last week's meeting. Um, and in your summary,